Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Now, very happy to bring in Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times. Hey, Jerry, great to have you on. Hi, Joe, you well? Yeah, very well. Matt Williams, hello. Hey, Joey. Hey, Jerry. So, Matt, I presume at some stage this week we're going to do a tribute piece to Shane Warren. In the meantime, as a placeholder, as the Aussie representative here on the panel, I'm sure you watched him. I know you love your cricket as well. He's going to be given a state funeral. Can you give cricket fans and non-cricket fans alike an insight into why Shane Warren has been talked about as a genius? He's uh, the equivalent of George Best to cricket. He was a man with God-given talents that could spin a cricket ball faster and more effective than any person ever to live, and he could land it on a five-cent piece. He revived the art of leg spin, which is where the ball comes out the back of your little finger which is it's just impossible. I couldn't even bowl it. My grandfather could bowl I couldn't do it. And no one could do it since the great Tiger O'Reilly in the 30s. And somewhere Warren turned up and just revolutionised the game, won these impossible matches with blonde hair and he was a little bit tubby. He was charismatic. He didn't care about people. He was so competitive. And he just won games. And then he lived this life out of where he made all these errors. There were sex scandals. He got banned for a year for taking a, an illegal substance that you buy at a chemist that was a, a diuretic. I uh, fell in love with Liz Hurley, you know, I'm the superstar model and movie star. And all along, all those errors and problems that, that were in his life, he owned them. And I think we all loved him more for it. But it, it, he... He was simply the greatest cricketer the world's seen since Bradman, probably only behind Bradman. There's one or two other people that could get into the argument. But then the, the other part with Warren is he just brought out a, um, a biography and there was a documentary done on him and basically just saying all those things, that he, he was owning all the problems in his life. He'd rebuilt the relationship with his children that he felt he lost through embarrassing them through a lot of the things that had, in his life that he wasn't proud of. And there were a lot of them that he said, including the affairs and things like this. And he just seemed to be back in a great place um, and, and enjoying, you know, the place in Australian society that he, he had earned uh, when this tragedy struck. And, and you know, it tells you about the man. Um, you know, from Kenny Dalglish to the Prime Minister of Australia, the Prime Minister of England, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, all coming out making statements Gary Lineker, and, and and his great opponent, Michael Vaughan, who was the captain of England when Warney ripped them apart, was in tears, as were his teammates. It's uh, it, it's just it's just a, a Shakespearean tragedy that that you just could not, if you wrote the book about it, it it's too unbelievable to um, to believe. As a brilliant tribute, you've got me a lot more interested in the Shane Warren piece that we should do very shortly. In fact, might get you in on it as part of it. Uh, did you say there the leg spin ball, because I'm not an aficionado I uh, should be upfront about saying so did you say there that it was a thing in the 30s and disappeared from the game effectively until he popped up Warren popped up in the 80s or 90s to revitalise it? Yeah, pr pretty much. You know, there's People who love their cricket will know that there were leg spinners. But there was one great leg spinner. I, I got a ball here. I wanted to. Show, I, I knew you'd ask me this question. The <laughs> ball comes out behind your little finger, so you, you just don't spin the ball. The ball exits your hand behind your little finger, so you're spinning like that. And remember, you've got to keep your arms straight as you come over. So your your elbow, your wrist is bent, and the ball comes out the back here. Like it's just so ungainly. And there was this genius. Bowler called Bill O'Reilly, obviously Irish Australian. Tiger O'Reilly was the same era as Bradman through the 30s, regarded as the greatest of all time. And he said someone else would come, but but the art was lost. It was it was over. There were there were leg spinners, but people, they were rubbish. You know, people had built them all around the park. And Warren came out, and not only brought it back, he was devastating. He ripped through the world's batsmen, 
and he was a so he used to make up these things. He said, I've, "I've developed a new ball called a flipper," and he would make up all these things that weren't true. But he was just mucking around <laughs> with the batsman's head, you know. And, and every ball he would bowl, he would stand and put his hand in his hips, go, "Oh, like this." And the wicket keeper would go, "Bowl, Warney," and the batsman's going, "What, what happened there?" You know, he, he was just this showman, as well as this. And and it's been said it was a god given talent that he could just and and the ball would fizz so the ball's got a, a ridge on it and when it when it moves through the air it makes a hissing sound and he could spin it that fast it would fizz in the air mm. as it came through to the batsman I mean it and if you Google up ball of the century his very first ball in Test in in Ashes cricket was against Mike Gatting. It's his very first ball. And again, you can't write this stuff. And the ball lands on the pitch, moves about two and a half feet through the air and bowls one of the greatest batsmen in the world clean, who just can't believe what he's seen. He literally cannot believe it. No one, no one in the world can, the ball of the century. Yeah. Yet, yet for all, for all his, his wonderful success, you know, like, um, I, you know, I was so sad. Australia was so sad. It, 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 it was, you know, 52... Um, it, it doesn't matter what success you have in your life. That's just uh, so, so sad that he, he, he's no longer with us. No, for sure. And I guess a very last one then, and we'll get into the rugby. When he arrives on the scene, rock and roll and bleach blonde hair, even the traditionalists who might have loved that, when they saw the leg spinner revitalised, must have said, oh, wow, there's something quintessentially cricket about this guy as well. I can see how he had the kids with the rock and roll and then the leg spinner... He's got everybody on board, then everybody's very excited when he arrives like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well the thing that the, the traditionalists love, tactically, he was an absolute genius. Like, he would move guys in the field and a minute later they'd take a catch. He was tactically brilliant. And except for his uh, off-field indiscretions, mm. he would have definitely captain Australia, would have been a great captain. But he never got that opportunity because... Of what he did, but he, he's he's taken more wickets than anyone in the or second most in the world. He's 700 wickets, the highest of any Australian. More than in the the uh, spinner from um, Sri Lanka has more, but you, you know this this guy was was just a revelation um, that that the world the world couldn't predict, uh, and, and to do it in such an unorthodox way where the world was you know these really athletic, big, fast bowlers pounding down big West Indians. And he was this little guy, a little bit overweight, loved the beer, had a smoke, had a smoke on the side. You know, he, <laughs> he was – and the Australians loved him for it. So he's got a statue in Melbourne. And the, the tributes outside his statues were cans of beer and packets of All cigarettes right. and flowers because he was a man of the people. And, um, you know, the people did, did truly love him. Amazing. You see, Jared, the yeah. only thing Matt likes talking about more than rugby is cricket. Don't blame him. The amazing subject, Shane Warren, amazing career. I was watching that Warren in a million tribute to him on Sky Sports, and even both of them went so far as to call him the greatest cricketer of all time. I was too. He was a rarity to a really likable Australian cricketer. Sorry, Matt, I wouldn't say that about all your cricketers. Um, but uh, uh, really likable character, you could see. Great commentator too. Just brilliant commentator. Yeah. Just love comedy. I'd be a big cricket fan. I don't like cricket. I love it. And uh, yeah, Warren, he, one, one in a million for sure. Really shocking. Yeah. Joe, to finish it off, I, I, I go to the cricket. In Sydney, the test matches on in January every year, and I, I would go to it. And one day, the cricket was so boring, my mate and I just said, let's forget this, we're going to the bar. And we went into the bar, and we got home, and we found out Warren had taken seven wickets while we'd been in the bar for the hour and a quarter. <laughs> That's what he could do to a game of cricket. Okay. You know, he, he could just... He just won games that were impossible to win. To matters at hand... We should just mention, Jerry, Mick Dawson, his exit from Leinster, uh, confirmed as CEO. So he's going to go at the end of next season, I think, or is it this season? This season. This season. So how do you sum up the Dawson era? At a glance, it was pretty damn successful. Well, he took over in what was it, November 2001. And in his 21 years um, at the helm of, as CEO of Leinster, they've... Um, they're unrecognisable, and he's presided, helped preside over the most successful era in the province's history by some distance. They've uh, the bare facts are they've won four European Cups, Challenge Cup, eight what are now URC titles, a couple of Celtic Cups, a couple of British and Irish Cups, 
He also presided over the redevelopment of Donnybrook, the move to the RDS, the redevelopment of the RDS, um, the development of a high performance centre in UCD. Um, pretty um, successful strike rate with uh, his appointment of coaches, including your man the other, the other end of this call. Um, like when he brought in um, Michael Shack, every said Michael who, even when he brought in Joe Schmidt, all the people said Joe who, and then to bring in Leo Cullen and then Stuart Lancaster as well. Leinster have become the Remember when in the early noughties, very much of the noughties, Munster was the bulk suppliers of the Irish team and that's completely flipped now to the point where Leinster have been the bulk suppliers for about a decade now. Um, he leaves it in an altogether unrecognisable shape from when he first took over. Um, he uh, he often joked to me that, you know, he, the three Ds um, decide, delegate and disappear more often to the golf course, but he does himself an injustice. He had a very, he had a very, very good way about him, very calm, um, uh, ship captain running the ship, and uh, yeah, and he moves. He, I think the main reason he's moving on is because it's his time to become Lansdowne president. It tells you everything about the Dawsons in Lansdowne Rugby Club that uh, he's the fourth after his grandfather, father, and brother to become a president of Lansdowne and does so in their 150th year. So I think the, the lure of that was too much, and he will devote a fair bit of time to that role because it's so important to, them, um, to that club. So yeah, yeah, fantastic, fantastic career. Matt, wouldn't have a huge profile. I mean, when Jerry says disappear is one of his Ds, I'm not surprised to hear that because he's not out there courting attention or telling everyone what a great job he's done over the years. He would have every right to by appearances. Have you had money dealings with Dawson over the last two th- decades? Yeah, yeah, I have. Mick, so I, I've got huge respect for Mick and he's done a phenomenal job, has never sought uh, the limelight, never sought attention and does the exact opposite, as Jerry said. Um, you know, he, he is, uh, yet he has presided over all those incredible achievements on the field. Um, the, the, the big one for me with Mick was, was Leinster had zero facilities. Like when, when Mick took over and I was there, we had nothing. And, and I think that stuck with Mick uh, over the years and what he's built, the, the physical um, establishment of that high-performance training centre that Leinster had, will will stand Leinster in good stead for another 20 years. And that he, he has uh, presided over all those things. And he has presided over the internal um, continuance of Leinster. So Leinster is run by ex-players. And people have worn the jersey, who know what the jersey is about. And, that, that, and he has constantly uh, put himself in the background behind that. Um, he organised a reunion for us a few weeks ago, Jolie, I was telling you about it. Mm. It's a wonderful day. But again, Mick just organised it, did everything for us, shook our hands and we thanked him dearly and, and he just stepped away from it. Didn't look for any kudos or uh, reward. Um, he, he has been, like like every good sporting organisation, it all starts in your, in your back rooms. And having Mick there controlling the politics, there's politics in Irish rugby everywhere, controlling the politics, keeping it centred on, on making the field work. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, his replacement will be um, a very, very important um, decision for the continuance of Leinster's success because he has had a lot to do with where Leinster are today. Yeah. Jerry, who's going to go for it? Would Leo Cullen fancy something like that? Um... I'd be surprised. Hasn't he already signed on as coach for next season? Another one-year deal. Yes. Um, I would imagine there might be some other kind of role in the future for Leo within Leinster, but it wouldn't be CEO, Joe. I'd say it'd be more like uh, the equivalent of Dave, David Nussifor in the RFU, kind of some kind of elite player management role or something like that. You know what I mean? Running that kind of off-the-scenes um, stuff. I, I'm, I've been told of a couple of people who within the setup that might be in the running for it, and Guy East would be obviously one of those, but then they could well go outside as well. I mean, they're talking about employing an outside agency to headhunt and recruit, so we'll see. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to mention something else before we get into England-Ireland week. So uh, I don't even know necessarily what the question will be here, but it's almost to let the listeners know, and even you guys if you haven't seen the interview. So Razi Erasmus yesterday popped up in the mail on Sunday. He's pictured there looking very uh, relaxed and happy in uh, Cape Town. He was interviewed by Nick Simon and... To be fair to him, it sounds like he's been through the ringer. So I suppose the main thrust of the interview is for him to say he absolutely did not leak this video in a bid to influence the referee or put pressures on the referees. 
for the uh, subsequent test. So he says to Nick Simon here in the Mail on Sunday, people think I leaked that video. I didn't. Who leaks something like that? Why would I screw up my whole career to do that? I've got twin girls, 18 years old, who are at school and they hear other parents telling them how their dad effed it all up. My mum at an old age home and they're showing her articles saying Razzie's lost it, he's got depression, he's drunk. They think those things because they are indoctrinated that I leaked the video. I want to tell the world, swearing on my youngest child's life, I did not leak that video. And he goes on to talk about uh, the making of the video where he called Nick Berry after the initial test and he spoke to Joel uh, Judage of World Rugby and Joe Schmidt, who was with World Rugby then, and they said they would uh, talk to uh, various people about things and he just wasn't satisfied. He tried to get in touch with Nick Berry and didn't have a good conversation with Nick Berry, the referee, about what had happened. He said that he didn't think they were... Um, the feedback he was receiving was adequate. He said only the most obvious mistakes were admitted, but the serious mistakes which affected the outcome of the match were not, is a quote from Erasmus. So he said, I submitted the video link to the restricted group using Vimeo, which is secure and safe, wasn't possible for anyone to even search for the video and he said he's used that platform for ages and there has never been a breach of confidentiality before. He said if I wanted to leak the video there were many more effective ways to do it and uh, Joe Schmidt was one of those that he did uh, send it to as was uh, Joel Judage of World Rugby and he goes on to talk about the pressure then and the fallout from it all. So he says before the second test all of the families would come and join the players in advance of the game in the bubble. Everyone else's wives and daughters came in before the second and third test, but my girls didn't want to come. They felt embarrassed. They felt their own father had embarrassed them. Think about it. Do you know how that feels? My close friends would send me WhatsApp messages saying, are you okay, buddy? He says, before that second test, so this is after he's leaked the video and all the fallout is raging. Before that second test, I was crying in my room. I cried out of fear. I was afraid. If we had lost the second test, can you imagine the shit I would have got from my own people? And that, in effect, is what he has to say about the whole thing. He said the last week before the third test was a bit more normal, but he was conscious. Everyone is saying, I ruined the tour and I ruined rugby. I'm not proud of that. It's awful. I haven't spoken to Warren. And that's sad, very sad. We didn't even say goodbye. I think he thinks I leaked the video. That makes me sad. Now, Matt Williams, if he's not telling the truth there, he's a hell of an actor. I mean, it's hard to not take that uh, very um, sincerely when he's swearing on his child's youngest life that he did not leak the video or want it leaked. Uh, I, I agree with you, Joe. I, look, as a, someone that's been in an international coach where you're dealing with referees, I didn't see any value in him leaking that. I saw only negatives. So, So... Yeah, for him to say he didn't leak, that doesn't surprise me. I, I, I never subscribed to the belief that he leaked it because what, what are the possible benefits for him in leaking it? You know, you know, with all these things, you've got to follow the money. Who benefits? So he didn't benefit. The, I'm not suggesting anything. I don't have got a clue. Uh, but it made him look bad and took the, took the pressure off the referees in some way. As I said to you, Joe, before, I've said to Jerry, the content of what Rassi said in that video for international referees and coaches is nothing. It is not bad. Uh, Nigel Owen said the same thing. It is a conversation that coaches have with referees every week of big games, post-games post -game, post and pre-games. The only thing unusual about that was the world got to see it. And it wasn't in Rassi's interest that the world see it. For, for, as for everything Rassi's just put out there, and for the fact that the referees um, didn't like it, and I don't blame them for, for, for not liking it being put out in the public. So who would do it, why they would do it, I'm, I'm at a loss. But, you know, I, look, like the other part, Joe, I, I know Rassi. I don't know him well anymore. I knew him when he was a young man and playing, and he always struck me as a very decent man. He always struck me as an honest person. I'm usually pretty good with that sort of evaluation. And if he's saying that, you know, I, I, I have nothing from my associated with him from the past to suggest that he's not a man that should be believed should be anything but but be believed Jerry your thoughts on the interview well I haven't read it I just so I'm only listening to what you've only just heard about it now this is the first I've heard of it and what you read out there Joe um yeah it's hard not to take him at face value it sounds very genuine very sincere that he didn't mean it to be um issued publicly um I seem to remember him saying something at the start of it when watching it at the time 
um, saying something like, I'm not sure who's going to see this or where this is going to go, something like that. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I accept his word that he if he's, that he didn't really want to release this puppy and what that was his intention. Um, all I will say is, yes, it must have caused him a lot of distress by the sounds of it. And I safely say it caused Nick Berry a lot of distress as well. Um, you, you know, I think I'm right in saying Nick Berry's got a South African wife, so it would have affected his family um, a lot as well, that whole uh, video. And, uh, yeah, there were, there were no real winners unless you think that it helped influence the officiation in the second test and therefore ultimately the Springboks were winners. But with the game of rugby, it was an awful shame, I think, mm. really. And, um, yeah, it's a shame it happened. And uh, I take him out of his face value. He didn't mean to do it. Well, that was the accusation at the time, wasn't it, Jerry? That this is going to put colossal pressure on the referee for the second test. And then in the and second test, there were a number of controversial decisions which did go the Springboks way. And so people say, well, Razzie has won here. You know, mission accomplished. Yeah. Well, the, well, they were they were scared. There was it was um, um, they were just scared to make decisions. It was there was there, they, it was paralysis by analysis of the referees for once because it, I think the first half took longer than the actual video itself. It was sixty two minutes around yeah. one minute. <laughs> I could, just I could, so scared, yeah. scared of making decisions as a result. That first so half never degree, ended. That, yeah, so to that degree, and a lot of things went on. There were a few high hits in that match that weren't, there weren't even, there wasn't even sightings afterwards. It was like that whole that whole commitment towards reducing the tackle height and and you know sanctions for any player's red card, like we saw with the Ireland Italy game. I'm surprised that's been even been debated again. But in that second test, there was no question of any red cards to. Like further like the fuel of what in the fallout from the first test so I think it had a huge impact on the officiating of the rest of the series but particularly in that, that second test mm. uh, Let's turn to England-Ireland then so Twickenham 4.45 on Friday night we'll have France uh, in Cardiff so Renfro is going to go a long way towards deciding this tournament Matt you can be our designated Eddie Jones psychologist here and tell me what he's up to because on our last visit to Twickenham he referred to Ireland as the United Nations of Rugby given all these players who weren't born in Ireland were playing for Ireland. Uh, this time around, he's been incredibly nice. He's talking about Ireland as the most cohesive side in the world. He says, they are literally, and I say this without hesitation, the most cohesive side in the world. The bulk of their team, they train together for the bulk of the year. They're well coordinated in attack, very structured. They're sequenced in set plays and they're tough around the breakdown. So he only had nice things to say about Ireland. Am I, should I be more worried or less worried? Joe, you, you, you've fallen into it again, mate. You're listening to him. <laughs> just, just, when, just as soon as you see him start talking, put it on mute. Just don't listen to it. Because whatever's coming out of his mouth here is not the truth. <laughs> so last year it wasn't the truth. This year it's not the truth. He's given you things that either his people want to hear or the opposition want to hear. Don't, Eddie, Eddie's, uh, if, you look at, if you look at him, Joe, like this 18 months from every World Cup, he, he, he's, he's gone through a process with his teams. His, his focus isn't on this year's Six Nations. It doesn't mean he want to lose it, and he certainly doesn't want to lose uh, against Ireland. Don't get me wrong, I didn't mean that. But he is bringing people in. He's moving people around. He's got two new assistant coaches in. He's just getting everything in place for 2023, as he did, if we all remember, in 2018. So if you can all think back to 2018 when Ireland went over and Played absolutely magnificent rugby in the first half there on St. Patrick's Day to win the Grand Slam. England, they didn't look a shambles, but they weren't what they we, we, everyone knows they could be. 18 months later, a lot of those problems were, were changed. Eddie's also got a lot of players out injured. There's a lot of quality boys that will, you know, if fit would be starting, are on the sidelines. So he's bringing in other guys. He's changed his bench. Or, or we, we're assuming it's a bench. We haven't seen the starting 23. You know, he's, he's leaving out guys like Marler and so on. Have a whole lot of caps, which is stirring things up a bit. So, you know, Eddie, Eddie when, as soon as he starts talking, just put your fingers in your ears and make a noise so you don't hear it. Because he's just pushing you in a direction that he doesn't want you to see. Mm. So what what is it we should see? England are tweaking a, a really tough side. They've got a really good tight five. Uh, that that if if uh, Johnny Hill comes back, which we believe he will, they're, they're probably still not the cohesive backline attack that we expect from England. The three quarter line still very very shaky. With 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 we're assuming to a he's not going to make it, and uh, Owen Farrell out. So you know Johnny May, Andrew Watson. So so th- there's definitely reasons. Yeah. 
for this England side to be down. But uh, yeah, Joe, don't don't listen to him, mate. Well, he's just so damn entertaining. I can't stop. I know you love it. I know you love he, it. He did. Uh, further to your point, though, Jerry, he did make a few points which all point towards everything Matt's talking about. You know, he was saying like, hey, look at the spine of our team: our nine, ten, and fifteen that played against Wales, and they had twelve times, twelve times the amount of caps we had. How much better are we going to be in twelve months with another ten caps? under our belt at 9, 10 and 15, for instance. And then I think he's sort of talking about Ireland here as well, Jerry. He's And maybe this points to the reason uh, maybe Ireland do better outside of World Cup years. He was saying, look, we're in a very good position. We've got over 12 months until we get together for the last part of this project. And he said the three months before the World Cup, you know, unlike Ireland where it's basically Leinster and bulk suppliers, he said the three months before the World Cup is where every team becomes equal. We all have the same amount of time to practice and we all have the same and we all have the players yeah for the same amount of time so that was a, kind of an interesting point that Ireland do probably have an advantage over England when it comes to things like cohesion and Jones probably looks at next summer as the time when it all gets knitted together yeah um, I suppose there's a certain validity in that there's certainly a lot of validity in you know getting used to a relatively new scrum half and new at half to such key positions and Marcus Smith is such an instinctive player that eventually the more other players play with him, the more they're going to read his next goose step or his next, you know, next break or half break or pass, whatever. They're, they are going to learn to play off of more and more and more. And there's no doubt that Marcus Smith is the future for this English team. Um, he's a brilliant, brilliant talent. Um, Harry Randall looks like a nice player at Scrum Half as well. Again, they're going to learn more from playing with him. Freddie Seed. So your, Stewart looks a good player too. Max Malins looks a good player. Like there's a lot of good players. There's a good England team trying to break out here, and it would be no surprise if they do so over the next eighteen months because A. Jones is such a past master at um, managing World Cup campaigns. He's done it with Australia. He's done it with Japan. He did it with England the last World Cup game, the final, um, one of their greatest ever performances in that semi final against New Zealand. And if Kyle Sinclair doesn't go off injured in two minutes, that really had a seismic effect in that final. You know, I was there, and it was just profound the effect it had in that match. And I'm not sure that England wouldn't have won that final if Kyle Sinclair had gone off injured because Dan Cole has always had huge problems with the beast. And he certainly had huge problems that day. And with each penalty, it was like a, it was almost like the equivalent of a try. The, the reverberations around the ground, it just had such... You know, just, South African chest swelled and England just became more and more deflated. So he could be a World Cup winner now as well. Despite the fact that they're trying... This is supposedly New England. They, they could well be on three wins out of three. I mean... They, they had enough possession and territory to win that first game in Scotland. They certainly had enough possession and territory to beat Wales, and Julie did if they made heavy heavy weather at the end. But for all this talk of New England, for me, it's still like Old England, and it's Old England against New Ireland, as far as I can see it. Mm. Like, watch their game again against Wales, and there's a lot of one-off runners. It's the power game. It's, it's you know, a lot of kicking, get into the opposition 22. They've got 12 points out of pressure to break down for Marcus Smith, you know, getting Wales being paying four times... Um, they only made two line breaks, they didn't create an awful lot. Their try was down to a little bit of tugging or barging at the line out by Atoje and Adam Beard and um, Elias the hooker. They, they allowed England to close the space. Mike Adams wasn't, wasn't refereeing it. And it was um, a dubious try in that sense. But hey, you know, Alex Dombrandt, who's done very well for them, took it well. Ellis Genge is playing some great rugby. Maro Atoje, I told, was very poor in the first game against Scotland, one of his most notable contribution was to concede two penalties in that crucial last 10 minutes. Um, he's He was much better against Wales. He's improved with each game. Courtney Laws is back and Don Brands come in. So they're, Ellis Gange just playing some great rugby. So they have a lot of power and there's no doubt about it. You know, it's Twickenham. It's still a tough place to go and win. But I, I don't... Watch them against Wales. They don't have the, the variety in attack that Ireland do. They certainly don't have as many ball-playing, skillful forwards with um, footwork that Ireland have. And... Um, and, and yeah, like I said, they're still learning how to play with Smith. There's not an awful lot of variety in their attacking game. Um, so I think it's a little bit like Old England being New Ireland. It'd be very interesting to see how it pans out. Yeah. Matt, a few points, like at Twickenham notwithstanding, and Andrew Porter is out, so it'll be Keane Healy and Dave Kilcoyne, presumably. And you mentioned Johnny Hill's back. I think Sam Underhill is back as well, so that Underhill-Curry uh, partnership is not to be totally discounted. Uh, all of those points are taken the general sense I'm picking up on is that Ireland are in just a much, much better place than England. And even though they've been beaten there, what, twice in 10 years, you said, Jerry, in the last uh, 10 in the Six Nations? The in the Six Nations. Yeah, 2018, Ireland and, and Scotland last year. 
Uh, there's still like there's an almost it's an eerie like worrying sense. Ireland will go over there and and really should win this game, Matt. Even though that's not something we say very often about trips to Twickenham, but that seems to be the sense. Well, I think there's there's reason for for Ireland to be very confident and have belief, um, while still having caution. You know, and it, Twickenham is never an easy place, even when when England are useless. And there have been plenty of times in history where they have been. It's still not an easy place to go. The English backline attack currently is non-existent, so that's another reason. Now Smith's a great kicker, and and what Jerry said, I completely concur. It's old England. That's where you've got to stop listening to Jones. And and what are your eyes seeing? And here's the facts: that England have scored a try off off a Welsh line out that was a stuff up. And they scored, Smith scored a try going down the short side off a mall where really was Ben Young set it up because Ben Young went short side and drew in the defence and threw the ball and Smith just ran onto it. But the English back line has been pathetic. They've got no penetration. Now let's switch that on its head. What about Ireland? Only trouble is against Italy, all we learnt was that world rugby is incompetent in running its own laws. That's the only thing. Italy didn't learn anything, Ireland didn't learn anything because the game was a farce. What we look back on what Ireland have been doing, they went to Paris to a really hard place against a really good team and for 15 minutes of that game, they dominated the French and in that 15 minutes, they got three tries. I I, I exaggerate, they got two tries because Mac Hansen's try was, was earlier in the game. If Ireland can go over and in put their game on the field For 20 minutes to 25 minutes, there's enough in that to win the game. Now, they've got to be disciplined. There's a bit of a worrying trend with Ireland. They've given away penalties uh, while in in possession of the ball, which hasn't been the case uh, up until the last last, uh, few games in this championship because Smith will kick the points. But if Ireland can put their game together for 20 to 25 minutes, there's lots of reasons to believe this Irish side can win. And, and that, that's not based on hope or, you know, uh, uh, we're all jumping for Ireland. That's based on evidence of what we've seen. Jerry, what are the selection dilemmas for Andy Farrell and what way do you think he's going to lean? An interesting one, Joe. I, I make it there could be as many as six changes from the Italian game for this. Um, I would imagine Hugo Keenan comes back in at fullback. There's a selection issue at right wing, whether he goes with Matt Hansen again or restores Andrew Conway. The selection issue at 12 and whether he restores Bundiaki. Or Robbie Henshaw. I can't really call the right wing one, but I think Bundyaki might come back in at midfield. Um, Robbie's only played about five games this season. Aki just looked a bit more match hardened. Johnny Saxon would presumably come back in at 10. There has to be a change at loose head where Andrew Porter is significant loss for all the experience that Keen Heaney and Dave Coyne have. Um, and I would imagine James Ryan comes back into the second row and that Caelan Dars reverts to six to accommodate Jack Conan simply because that back row has gone so well for Leinster and Ireland this season, by and large. And uh, yeah, I, I know Doris was, I thought Doris was outstanding against Italy, even that first 20 minutes, I thought he was the best player on the pitch. And he gets more involvements at number eight, just the nature of the position, than he does at six. And his involvements are all good, by and large, because he's such a skillful, clever, strong, all round footballer. You know, he takes great lines, good footwork, good passer, good distributor. But I think that's what they might do. And then, um, maybe have Ian Henderson's um, horsepower back in the bench after his 18 minute shift for Ulster the other night and um, yeah and Robbie Henshaw maybe covering a 23 the number 23 jersey so I think that's what he might do mm. What do you think Matt? I'm with uh, Jerry on, on almost all those and, and I don't know but I suspect a, a very real option could be Ryan and Henderson in the second row with Byrne at six Doris going back to eight and a dilemma of keeping Conan or Omani on the bench with Ryan Baird also coming on the bench because that will give them some extra bulk around against uh, England where the last few nightmarish times Ireland's visited Twickenham, they've been bashed up. Uh, that may be an option for them and, uh, and that will depend on how they assume or how they um, uh, measure uh, Henderson's fitness after the 80 minutes. Can he, can he go for an hour uh, at, at, um, at Twickenham? 
Not saying they will do that because I agree with Jerry's comments. That back row has been excellent. But I think it is a real viable option for them uh, with Burn. It's, I, I think Burn, that's his real position. He's doing a fantastic job. Don't get me wrong. Burn's automatically selected in the second row or in the back row there. He's the number one selection. But he, he is so versatile that it does give them another option. And it also gives them some serious line out options with four jumpers. Okay. Fellas, clock's against us. Uh, thanks so much. That was great. Enjoy uh, the game as we build up to it across the rig. Matt Williams, thank you. Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times, thanks a million, Jerry. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, Matt. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Jerry. Bye now. And our rugby coverage here on Off the Ball is with thanks to Vodafone, maiden sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. We have rugby right across the week. So tomorrow, 8 o'clock, Brian O'Driscoll in studio looking ahead to England, Ireland in plenty more detail.